One. A good cafe on the Place Saint Michel. Then there was the bad weather. It would come in one day when the fall was over. You would have to shut the windows in the night against the rain, and the cold wind would strip the leaves from the trees in the Place Contrescarpe. The leaves lay sodden in the rain, and the wind drove the rain against the big green autobus at the terminal, and the Café des Amateurs was crowded, and the windows misted over from the heat and the smoke inside. It was a sad, evilly run café, where the drunkards of the quarter crowded together, and I kept away from it, because of the smell of dirty bodies and the sour smell of drunkenness. The men and women who frequented the amateur stayed drunk all of the time or all of the time they could afford it, mostly on wine which they bought by the half-leader or leader. Many strangely named aperitifs were advertised, but few people could afford them except as a foundation to build their wine drunks on. The women drunkards were called poivrat, which meant female rummies. The Café des Amateurs was the cesspool of the Rue Mouftar, that wonderful, narrow, crowded market street which led into the Place Contrescarpe. The squat toilets of the old apartment houses, one by the side of the stairs on each floor with two cleated cement shoe-shaped elevations on each side of the aperture so a locataire would not slip, emptied into cesspools which were emptied by pumping into horse-drawn tank wagons at night. In the summertime, with all windows open, you would hear the pumping and the odor was very strong. The tank wagons were painted brown and saffron, and in the moonlight, when they worked the Rue Cardinal Le Moine, their wheeled, horse-drawn cylinders looked like Brock paintings. No one emptied the Café des Amateurs, though, and its yellowed poster stating the terms and penalties of the law against public drunkenness was as fly-blown and disregarded as its clients were constant and ill-smelling. All of the sadness of the city came suddenly with the first cold rains of winter, and there were no more tops to the high white houses as you walked but only the wet blackness of the street and the closed doors of the small shops, the herb sellers, the stationery, and the newspaper shops the midwife, second class, and the hotel where Verlaine had died, where you had a room on the top floor, where you worked. It was either six or eight flights up to the top floor, and it was very cold, and I knew how much it would cost for a bundle of small twigs, three wire-wrapped packets of short, half-pencil-length pieces of split pine to catch fire from the twigs, and then the bundle of half-lengths of hardwood, that I must buy to make a fire that would warm the room. So I went to the far side of the street to look up at the roof in the rain and see if any chimneys were going, and how the smoke blew. There was no smoke, and I thought about how the chimney would be cold and might not draw, and of the room possibly filling with smoke, and the fuel wasted, and the money gone with it. And I walked on in the rain. I walked down past the Lycée Henri IV, and the ancient church of saint etienne du mont and the windswept Place du Panthéon, and cut in for shelter to the right, and finally came out on the lee side of the Boulevard Saint-Michel, and worked on down it past the Cluny and the Boulevard Saint-Germain, until I came to a good café that I knew on the Place Saint-Michel. It was a pleasant café, warm and clean and friendly and I hung up my old waterproof on the coat rack to dry and put my worn and weathered felt hat on the rack above the bench and ordered a café au lait. The waiter brought it, and I took out a notebook from the pocket of the coat and a pencil and started to write. I was writing about up in Michigan, and since it was a wild, cold, blowing day, it was that sort of day in the story. I had already seen the end of fall come through boyhood, youth, and young manhood and in one place you could write about it better than in another. That was called transplanting yourself, I thought, and it could be as necessary with people as with other sorts of growing things. But in the story the boys were drinking, and this made me thirsty, and I ordered a rum St. James. This tasted wonderful on the cold day, and I kept on writing, feeling very well and feeling the good Martinique rum warm me all through my body and my spirit.
A girl came in the cafe and sat by herself at a table near the window. She was very pretty, with a fresh face as a newly minted coin, if they minted coins in smooth flesh with rain-freshened skin, and her hair black as a crow's wing and cut sharply and diagonally across her cheek. I looked at her, and she disturbed me and made me very excited. I wished I could put her in the story, or anywhere. But she had placed herself so she could watch the street and the entry, and I knew she was waiting for someone. So I went on writing. The story was writing itself, and I was having a hard time keeping up with it. I ordered another rum St. James, and I watched the girl whenever I looked up, or when I sharpened the pencil with a pencil sharpener with the shavings curling into the saucer under my drink. I've seen you, beauty, and you belong to me now, whoever you are waiting for, and if I never see you again, I thought. You belong to me, and all Paris belongs to me, and I belong to this notebook and this pencil. Then I went back to writing, and I entered far into the story and was lost in it. I was writing it now, and it was not writing itself, and I did not look up nor know anything about the time, nor think where I was, nor order any more rum St. James. I was tired of rum St. James without thinking about it. Then the story was finished, and I was very tired. I read the last paragraph, and then I looked up and looked for the girl, and she had gone. I hope she's gone with a good man, I thought, but I felt sad. I closed up the story in the notebook and put it in my inside pocket, and I asked the waiter for a dozen portugaises and a half carafe of the dry white wine they had there. After writing a story, I was always empty, and both sad and happy, as though I had made love, and I was sure this was a very good story, although I would not know truly how good until I read it over the next day. As I ate the oysters with their strong taste of the sea and their faint metallic taste that the cold white wine washed away, leaving only the sea taste and the succulent texture, and as I drank their cold liquid from each shell and washed it down with the crisp taste of wine, I lost the empty feeling and began to be happy and to make plans. Now that the bad weather had come, we could leave Paris for a while for a place where this rain would be snow coming down through the pines and covering the road in the high hillsides and at an altitude where we could hear it creak as we walked home at night. Below Les Avons, there was a chalet where the pension was wonderful and where we would be together and have our books and at night be warm in bed together with the windows open and the stars bright. That was where we would go. I would give up the room in the hotel where I wrote, and there was only the rent of 74 Rue Cardinal Lemoine, which was nominal. I had written journalism for Toronto, and the checks for that were due. I could write that anywhere, under any circumstances, and we had money to make the trip. Maybe away from Paris, I could write about Paris, as in Paris I could write about Michigan. I did not know it was too early for that because I did not know Paris well enough but that was how it worked out eventually. Anyway, we would go if my wife wanted to, and I finished the oysters and the wine and paid my score in the café and made it the shortest way back up the Montaigne saint jean through the rain that was now only local weather and not something that changed your life to the flat at the top of the hill. I think it would be wonderful, Tati, my wife said. She had a lovely mottled face, and her eyes and her smile lighted up at decisions, as though they were rich presents. When should we leave? Whenever you want. Oh, I want to right away. Didn't you know? Maybe it will be fine and clear when we come back. It can be very fine when it is clear and cold. I'm sure it will be, she said. Weren't you good to think of going, too?